Let me go next, and then we'll take a break until the next session to talk about why this is all happening, to go back to the beginning of the case, because it's equally corrupt and equally biased in the direction of finding, assuming that a child was a victim. The way the case started was with a child that was younger than average for the McMartin preschool. He was only three and a half years old. The mother, who had many, many of her own problems, wanted the child to be there. She obviously needed help, and she was the child was allowed to be there despite that he was somewhat of a behavior problem. Eventually, that mother came to be belief that her child was being sodomized, and the only place she could think of where a male had an opportunity to be in contact with their little boy was at the McMartin preschool. So she eventually reported her suspicion. The way she did that was, it came about because her child was having itching and discomfort around his anus at night. He would wake up crying and he would be scratching and the mother couldn't seem to comfort him. So she took him to a local hospital. They examined the child, and this itching and scratching at night, they just said a little bit of uh, erythema, which is a medical term for redness, and signs of scratching around the anus. They did not raise the issue of sexual abuse, but they referred the child to the UCLA Medical Center. They examined the child again, and that's where they raised the bar by saying, child's anus is suspicious for sexual abuse. And that's because the mother had told them of her suspicions and because of the findings of this redness and some signs of scratching. Now, what they didn't do, what neither the initial hospital did, or the UCLA Medical Center, this internationally known University of California medical facility didn't do, was the most basic pediatric diagnostic test on an extremely common problem with children. It's called pinworms. Now, I, of course, can't sit here and tell you in 1985 that the, you know, that the child in 1983 uh, you know, first studied in 85. I can't look back two years and say, yes, I know the child had it. I can't tell you right now that I know the child had it. But what I can tell you is the child certainly could have had it. The pattern would fit exactly. And I even want to tell you why this is likely to happen at night. The female worm is living in the anus. That's the last part of the child's colon in the large intestine, I should say, just before the anus, which is where fecal matter can come out. It's the pattern of the worm to come out at night and lay their eggs. And the eggs on the skin are irritating. So that's why the child in typical form will wake up at night, start scratching, irritate themselves, and they get uncomfortable and they start to cry. Now, this is not fancy pediatrics. This is garden variety pediatrics. Yet that, oh, and by the way, what you do, you don't have to do anything invasive to the child to check it out. You don't even have to put anything through the anus since the issue is on the skin surrounding the anus. You take a piece of scotch tape and you put it down on the child's skin and you lift it off and put that under microscope and you can see the eggs, the pinworm eggs. They never bothered to do that. So, but it, to go back, it was UCLA's statement, suspicion of sexual abuse, which then led to report to the police, which then led to the investigation in 1983, which led to no findings whatsoever from talking to the children and the case on the uh, verge of being dropped but then referred to the Children's Institute International where these interviews started taking place, the interviews that trained the children under the assumption that they all had been abused to say things which were taken as evidence that they had been abused. 
And when you come back next time, I'm going to talk about who the people were in greater detail and how they came up with these methods, how they came up with these ideas, because these methods and ideas are with us to this day. They are sending thousands of innocent people to prison. I have come to that opinion based on studying eight or nine hundred cases in which one or more children are possibly abuse victims by somebody's reckoning. That would mean several thousand children, because in every case there could be one child, there could be dozens. If you add up one or a dozen or five or whatever the number is in each case of 800 to 1,000 cases, that means you're going to get several thousand children. I've studied probably nearly a, oh, 2,000 hours of audio or videotapes of children being interviewed by police and social workers usually. I've reviewed hundreds and hundreds of medical examinations complete with photographs and medical records of how those examinations are done. Study the testimony in hundreds of cases. The things I'm telling you are coming from a vast amount of experience and if you are not disturbed by the time we get done then I'm going to be disturbed. So please do come back and we'll talk about the background because that's very important because the people trained by the people who did the McMartin case or trained by the people they trained, the, the, the participants being trained by the second generation and the third generation are the ones who are continuing to do it to this very day. See you next time. So just to repeat, my firm belief that what I just said is the explanation of why interviewers are doing what they're doing. And I'm going to explain a little more about the sources for that. Is that they believe they're doing the right thing. They believe they're helping children. And they're sure that the child has been molested. Because they've been taught to believe that if the, a report was made, they must have said something. The child must have said something to somebody. And therefore, that's all you need to know. They must have been molested. Now my job is just to help them give the details. Well, it's not just the McMartin interviews that led me to that conclusion. 30 years of watching several thousand hours of t uh, listening to or watching uh, videotapes and audio tapes and other sources as well. Let me tell you another source that led me to that conclusion. Somebody else who also got involved in the McMartin case not in testimony, but as an ally and a supporter of these terrible methods. And that's Dr. Roland Summit, a psychiatrist who was in the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA and an affiliated hospital. And Dr. Summit had been meeting with people like Key McFarlane and people of like mind for months. And wrote an article which became kind of the, the uh, a leading position paper, you might say, of the interviewers like Key McFarlane and other social workers. In other words, because he was a psychiatrist and in meeting with these people became very sympathetic to what they believed and what they were doing, he wrote a paper which had a lot of impact. It was called the Child Sexual Abuse Accommodation Syndrome. Now, I don't know if you remember that in an earlier session, I said the very first case that I saw in this area, about six months before the McMartin case came to me, was that very paper written by Dr. Summit, the Child Sexual Abuse Accommodation Syndrome. And in that article, he specifically claims that children never make detailed allegations in investigations of abuse unless it happened. He's categorically denying that false allegations are a possibility. And he, in the article, is urging professionals to go to courts and advocate for the allegation to convince judges or juries that might be skeptical. And he's basing it on certain behaviors that he claimed a child that's been molested would 
demonstrate? Well, in brief, because I, I, it would just take a lot longer to do this than we have, in brief, there aren't any behaviors which will tell you whether a child has been molested or not. That is a fraud. There aren't any behavioral syndromes for so many things that sometimes people want to use. So there aren't a behavioral syndrome to whether you have molested a child as, you know, you're an adult who, a possible perpetrator, there are no behavioral syndromes of a child that has been a victim. Every single behavior that Dr. Summit talked about could equally be the behavior of a child that has not been victimized. And I'll just give you one of the five, and that is a child that didn't tell anybody for a while, and in other words, kept the secret. The first category in his so-called syndrome is secrecy. Well, think about this. If you put your thinking cap on and don't get caught up in this ill-advised movement that went overboard so drastically, you'd realize that the failure to claim that you were sexually abused for a period of time, let's say six months, is only a secret if you were abused. <laughs> it's obviously not a secret if nothing happened. And yet in hundreds and hundreds of cases, I have had to confront the testimony of expert witnesses brought who say the failure of the child to tell anybody about it for six months is an example of keeping a secret part of the accommodation syndrome. So you see the kind of twisted logic of people who are so convinced that they are helping a child. And I, I, write it, I put it down to what I call the joys of self-righteousness. Do you know any human beings, I'll start with myself, I hope you will include yourself, do you know any human beings who have not ever succumbed to the joys of self-righteousness? I don't think there are any. It's part of the human condition. But for goodness sake, professionals are supposed to, as part of their training, try to at least minimize it. When you're dealing with children, when you're dealing with issues that are central to their life, the possibility of casting them in a role of an abuse victim when they maybe have not been, could there be anything more, a situation more necessary to make sure you are being a, a careful professional than that? I don't know of any. And yet, thousands and thousands of children are being put in the scenario of being cast in the role of a sexual abuse victim when the evidence doesn't back it up because of this kind of thinking that I've been outlining for you. So the beha behavior that we've seen in the McMartin case and the help given to it by people like Roland Summit, who went on to claim that the interview techniques were exactly what they should be, Despite the fact that later on he had to admit, when I asked a reporter from the Canadian Broadcasting Company to ask him whether he'd ever watched any of the tapes, and if so, how he could justify the methods, admitted that he'd never watched one minute of one tape, even though he was in an LA Times editorial promoting Key McFarland's methods. So that's the kind of work that not only was done in that case, but is repeated, created in the early 80s, and is going on right now. And if there was ever an a example of abuse that came from mental health professions and brought into our society, it's the one that certainly I've seen the most of, the one that disturbs me the most, and the most that I, where I would like to assist the, in creative movement to do something about it. And maybe you'll choose to find out more about that subject. If so, you know where to come. Thanks for being here.